Back before television and even before radio, we get our entertainment from books and plays. We even played games. And before books, stories were told orally around a campfire much like this one. Yeah, hold on one second while I toss another log in the fire. We might be here a while. The story I want to tell you today happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Yeah, I'm just kidding. It happened right here in a country far, far away from where I sit here in New Hampshire. It also involves hominins who lived, loved, and died along the Hominin River. And of course, his bones. It always involves some very old bones. There is grandeur in this view of life. Welcome to Evolution Talk with Rick Coast, an introduction to the oldest story ever told. This story kicks off in 1959, and that's really not so long ago, right? Some of you listening right now may have been around at the time. It was in 1959 that teeth were found at the Old Divide Gorge in Tanzania. I might as well throw in a spoiler, too. They belonged to a hominin species we currently call Homo habilis. For decades, it's held a special place, the first hominin to hold the title of Homo, our first Homo ancestor. Notice I say currently call Homo habilis. I'll get to that. The spoilers end there. So where was I? Oh, right. The discovery in 1959. In 1959, and on the 19th of July, I think it was on the 17th of July, I was ill. That's British Kenyan paleoanthropologist Louis Leakey, who, with his wife Mary, discovered the fossilized remains of Homo habilis. As he said, he wasn't feeling well on that long-ago summer day in Tanzania. Poor Mr. Leakey had the flu. I stayed in camp in our trucks, and Mary went out alone as she spent the morning crawling up and down the cliffs of FLK-1 to see whether there was any sort of clue to be got. Round about 11, she was ready to pack up and come back. She did one more crawl up the cliff. She saw a small fragment of, first of all, what looked like a human skull. She bent down with her brush and brushed, and as soon as she brushed on the scree, there were actually two human teeth. Before the discovery of those teeth, the hunt was on to fill a gap in our knowledge of where the Homo genus began. We had Homo erectus, whom we'll meet in another episode, and the Australopithecus. There was something in between that had yet to be found. The Leakeys had also found the skull of Paranthropus boise, They also found at the site tools, a lot of tools. Again, Lewis Leakey. We don't know just exactly when primitive man first started to make sharp cutting edge tools, simple tools, but we are pretty sure that before he ever made them, he used natural sharp cutting edges which he found. And then one day, quite accidentally, he happened to hit two stones together and one broke and the flake that came off had a sharp edge. And that gave him the idea that he could make sharp cutting edges whenever he wanted them and not have to go looking for them and find them when nature had done so. He could make them. At the time, the teeth remained somewhat of a mystery. A year later, in 1960, more teeth were found as well as more bones. And the teeth resembled those of modern humans in many ways. The bones themselves were later to be determined to have been those of a boy. Given these finds at the gorge, the Leakeys had a few questions. They had the remains of two different hominin species. So who made the tools? Which one? Who did the human-like teeth belong to? Now the Leakeys were excited, to say the least. They had not one, but two different specimens. One Lewis Leakey eventually referred to as Ingenthropus boise, and the other, could it be an early form of homo? The one that predated Homo erectus? And who made those stone tools, the Oldowan tools? This new animal had some features that could be attributed to an ancestor of modern humans. For example, the hole for the spinal cord, the foramen magnum, it was located at the center of the skull base, a sign of bipedalism. And the leg and foot bones supported this. 
the finger bones, although slightly curved, were not as much as you would see in apes, suggesting, perhaps, an intermediate form and one capable of a strong grip, perhaps even strong enough to bang rocks together. And then there's the brain case. It was more rounded than that of apes, and it had more of a forehead suggesting a larger brain. Another item of interest were endocasts that were made of the brain case that indicate a bulge in the part of the brain known as Broca's area. The presence of this is also evidence of what may have been an early form of speech, or at least set it on the proper evolutionary path along the Hominin River. Now, it was decided that this new species had to have made those tools. It had both human-like and ape-like traits, and it did appear to be a true intermediary. Its strong grip, too, would have made tool-making possible, more so than Zinchanthropus, later to be known as Paranthropus. So, it all made sense to Leakey and the others. This new species was given the name Homo habilis. Habilis meaning handyman, maker of tools. And not only was Homo habilis granted ownership of the tools, it was also given an even greater distinction, that being the earliest form of Homo, the first ancestor of the Homo genus. When the Hominin River split, Habilis stood at that split. The exalted ground that Habilis stood upon was about to become extremely shaky. In 2013, a jaw was found not too far away from the location where Lucy had been found almost 40 years earlier in 1974. Found in an East African research area known as Ledi Gururu, the jaw was labeled LD350-1. When it was announced in the Journal of Science, it was revealed that the jaw was that of an early homo dated to 2.8 million years ago. This extends the homo genus back by another half a million years. Could it even be an ancestor of Homo habilis, an even earlier specimen of the genus Homo? Well, the features of the jaw and teeth align with that of an early form of Homo, and not as much as the Australopithecine, although it has a receding jawline that does resemble what one would see with the Australopithecus afarensis. The turns and the twists never stop. Homo habilis clung to the root of the Homo genus for half a century. It was about to be swept away. We do have, of course, Oldowan tools at around 2.6 million. And as Bernard and others have pointed out, perhaps that is a proxy for the genus Homo, or maybe it isn't. It's not outside the realm of possibility, given what we know about how chimpanzees can make tools that some Australopith was capable of making them too. So questions and an absence of evidence. That's Bill Kimball, director of the Institute of Human Origins at Arizona State University. But there's a myth out here in paleoanthropology that unless you have a complete skeleton, you're not prepared to answer any meaningful questions. And I wish to dispel that myth. You know, since Raymond Dart named Australopithecus in 1925, there have been a plethora of hominid species named, recognized. Australopithecus africanus, Paranthropus robustus, Paranthropus boisei, Homo habilis, on and on. Many of them, if not most of them, on the basis of material that we here today would consider at best imperfect. A fragment of a jaw, a bit of a brain case, some teeth, and the fact of the matter is, is that in the intervening years, the vast majority of those species recognized on the basis of imperfect material have been verified as to be meaningful evolutionary units. The jaw, the one found in 2013, LD350-1, raises more questions than there are answers. For now. And this question, the question that we address to this jaw, is it the same thing as Australopithecus at 2.8 million, or is it something different? And I engaged in that question with my former PhD student, Brian Vilmore, now at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and Chilacho Seum, our graduate student who found the jaw. And we came to the conclusion that in many respects, it differs from your standard issue, generalized Australopithecus jaw. 
So we have the leddy jawbone, which pushes the Homo genus back half a million years. That led many in paleoanthropology to question Homo habilis's rights to the throne. It really is a Game of Thrones, one that's fought with fossilized jawbones, teeth, and skulls. A 2015 article published in the Journal of Nature added to the battle to remove Homo habilis from the throne of the earliest Homo ancestor. In that article, it told that a team led by Professor Fred Spohr digitally reconstructed the jawbone the Leakies had found all those years ago. The reconstruction revealed the teeth were more parallel to one another and more aligned, no pun intended, to what we would find with an Australopithecine jaw. They also digitally reconstructed the brain case using parietal bones, which form the top and the sides of the skull behind the frontal bone. This was exciting because it indicates a larger brain than previously thought at about 800 cubic centimeters. So we have a larger brain and a species that actually is more Australopithecine than previously thought. A true intermediary, one that existed before Homo habilis. And the Leddy jaw found in 2013 supports this. Bernard Wood of George Washington University sums the whole dilemma up very well. It began to strike me that, that Homo habilis in general wasn't as modern human-like as it had been made out to be. And so my prejudice was that, uh, that Homo habilis had some of the features that you see in later members of our genus, but it lacked some important features that, that you would want to see in the earliest member of our genus. So we came to the conclusion that, that, um, that Homo habilis probably wasn't as good a candidate as being the earliest member of our genus as it was made out to be originally. The throne is up for grabs. The universe is full of mysteries, and you don't need me to tell you that. Here in our little blue mud ball, the banks of the Hominin River still have secrets to reveal. Homo habilis may not represent the earliest Homo specimen, but it has led us to a part of the river where we might find it. Perhaps Homo habilis is a form of Australopithecine, and perhaps it stood on its side of the river and watched Lucy and her family walk by on the other side. Did it cock its head and wonder what it was looking at? Did it maybe see a family resemblance, and who just threw that rock further back? Squint as we might to see it, the shape that threw that oddly formed rock with the sharp edges still pretty hard to make out. It's really foggy back there. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Evolution Talk. I'm Rick Coast, and if you find value in this show, please consider supporting it at evolutiontalk.com. I still have a lot of plans for it, and I can only do so with your support. Share the show with your friends. And at evolutiontalk.com, you will find more information, recommended books to read, and also ways to contact me. I'd love to hear from you. And I hope your week is going well, and until next time, please take care of yourself. Evolution Talk is a Rick Coast production.